Welcome everyone to the 38th annual Mayor's Interfaith Prayer Breakfast. I'm Alyssa Martin, Chair of the Planning Committee. Every year, different speakers and spiritual leaders participate in this event, drawing on a wide variety of sacred readings and wisdom traditions to lend their unique lens on a common theme. This year, our theme is Welcoming the Stranger, a theme that's not only relevant given recent world events and the displacement of so many people, but also very resonant as Lincoln has been a national leader in welcoming new communities. Many traditions represented in our great city have much to say about embracing those we might call strangers or those who may be on the margins of society. From the parable of the Good Samaritan to the Hindu saying, guest is God, to the emphasis on hospitality, generosity, and gratitude found in so many native traditions. We are called to, in the words of Albert Einstein, widen our circles of compassion to embrace all living beings. Today's featured speaker, Sister Marilyn Lacey, is a perfect example of such boundless and boundaryless compassion, as she has dedicated her life to making the world a more welcoming place for women and for persons forced to leave their homelands because of war or persecution. We'll kick off today's program with readings from members of the Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Sudanese and Yazidi communities in Lincoln. We will then hear from our honorary event chair, Mayor Gaylor Baird. Preta Bansal will then introduce Sister Marilyn Lacey and Joel Stoltenow, a local development coordinator with Lutheran Family Services who will facilitate what promises to be an inspiring and personal conversation with Sister Marilyn. Our program will conclude with comments from Ed Mejia, whose own experience as an immigrant and refugee helped inspire his design for the new Lincoln flag. We'll also hear from Breakfast Planning Committee members Farida Ibrahim and Darcy Blosser, and we'll close with the Buddhist benediction of loving kindness from Carla Angstrom, a beloved longtime contributor to the Interfaith Prayer Breakfast. I am deeply grateful to the sponsors of this event and to all those who have contributed both visibly and invisibly to the event's success. Thank you all for joining us virtually once again. We hope to be together in person next year. My name is Juan Carlos Huertas. I am the Minister of Proclamation and Practice of Justice at First Plymouth Church. And I, about 30 years ago, came to the United States from Puerto Rico. So I'm one of those with a, an experience of what it's like to come into a new place and have to learn a new language and culture. So I'm so glad that we're gathering together today to talk to what, together about holy hospitality. What's that look like for faith communities to be places of welcome to all people? So now let us bless one another as we gather together. Eternal One, stay with us. 
be with us as we talk to one another, as we engage one another through the Zoom time, and as we learn together what it looks like to be a people of holy hospitality. Danos tu bendición, Dios. Quédate con nosotros. We ask you these things in your name. Amen. Hello, I am Sairaja Gattamaneni, a member of the Hindu faith. In Hinduism, we welcome the stranger by recognizing that every stranger we meet is not actually a stranger. But instead a kindred spirit, Hinduism teaches that every person in the world has a divine spark and that this spark connects us all just as many different rivers flow to and from the same vast ocean. This unity of all humanity is reflected in Hindu tradition in many different ways. For example, our tradition emphasizes compassion and nonviolence for all beings regardless of race, gender, caste or religion. And there is a famous Hindu mantra that goes Matru Devo Bhava, Pitru Devo Bhava, Acharya Devo Bhava and Atiti Devo Bhava. Translated, this means be one for whom mother is God, father is God, teacher is God and guest is God. Uh, we are that told not just to provide hospitality to our guests but to shower our guests with the same love, care and affection as we would for God. This sentiment is also reflected in the meaning of the common Indian greetings Namaste. The spirit of Namaste means my soul honors your soul. I honor the light, love, truth and divinity within you because it is also within me. In sharing these things, we are united, we are one. Thank you. Namaste. As we say in Hebrew, Shalom la rachok ve la karov, which means peace be unto you who are far away, peace be unto you who are nearby. And we extend today on this prayer breakfast wishes of peace, well-being, safety to all those who are here right in our neighborhood, nearby in Lincoln, the state of Nebraska, the United States of America. Our prayers today go out as well, of course, to uh, the beloved people of Ukraine, a people that is near and dear to me as my wife is a Ukrainian born uh, woman who loves her country dearly and whose family today is in, in grave danger to their lives, to their well-being, to their existence. And friends, as we all join, wherever we may be, we join as well in prayers for well-being for everybody who is suffering around the world. And we plead with our Creator, the one and only God, regardless of the names that our traditions may ascribe to that one and only God that created us all, that is the Creator of all flesh, to bless all the inhabitants of our country, and our world with God's spirit, that all people, all races and creeds, all genders, all orientations, all colors and ethnicities forge a common bond in true harmony to banish hatred and bigotry and to safeguard the ideals and free institutions that are the pride and glory of all of us who, uh, who love you, God. We uh, reach out to you uh, using the words, repeating the words and the teachings of the prophet Isaiah, who in chapter 2 says, according to my translation, O oh God, make sure that you are the judge of many peoples, and they, they shall all beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And the nation shall not take up sword against nation, and that they will never again know war. 
as we uh, learn and read from the book of Psalms, chapter 29 at the very end. We pray to you, O God, to give us strength, to give the people who are suffering with plenty of strength, and then to bless us all with peace, with shalom. Amen. Welcome to our Mayor Interface Prayer Breakfast. My name is Joko Lek. I'm a Sudanese pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm originally from South Sudan, Africa. I left my country in 1983 while I was very young. And then I came to Ethiopia. I spent five years in Ethiopia. When I completed my high school in Ethiopia, I left for Kenya. I'd been in Kenya for two years until I get resettlement form to America. Now, I want to remind us, since the title of our program is Welcoming the Stranger. Here in Hebrew 13, one to two says, keep on loving one another as brother and sister. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Let us pray for the stranger in the world. God Almighty, grant to each one of us your children an awareness of your present and perfect confidence in you in this messy world. While we pray for the peace and healing in the world, remember that we are a direct reflection of you because you created us with your image. Apostle Paul reminded us, in you, Lord, there is either no longer Jews nor Gentile, for we are one in you. Bring your true peace as your son Jesus has promised in John 14, 27, saying, peace I leave with you, my peace I give it to you. As your children, we trust and believe in you. Has for your power to bring peace to Ukraine, Middle East, Europe, Africa, and the world in general. Guide us in all the challenge and the change that engulf our world today, that we may have transquality of spirit through Jesus Christ, our late Lord. I mean, may peace be with you. Amaltaka India. Bye bye. My name is Mrs. Lorraine Gerberts, community and religious leaders, dear Nebraskans, good morning. It's a great honor to be here and represent my community. My name is Flah Roshoka, a doctoral researcher here at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. When I heard about this year's theme by welcoming them the strongest, my mind went back to the October 5, 2016, when a plan landed in Lincoln Airport uh, with my family and me on the board. At the first moment, we found Catholic Social Service, Lincoln Yazidia community, other community members of the Lincoln waiting and welcoming us and building a bridge of friendships. We never feel that we are a newcomer or refugees. Since the moment we arrived, Lincoln has become a home for us. Our journey ended up with the taking the oath to become a United States citizen last week. There is famous Yezidia prayer which says, My God, the greatest, with all your power, please protect all the communities and then the Yezidia, including 8,000 creatures. As you can see, the Yezidia pray for all other communities than the Yezidia and even for 8,000 organisms. There's also a, a Yezidia proverbs which say, Your home is where you are. Protect and help the community and live in peace. Your, your, your day will come. As a science person, I decided to give back to the, this community through research work try, and try to make Lincoln a healthy place for everyone. With my advisor, Dr. Megan Kelly, we developed booklets and educational materials to help Lincoln Yazidia community navigate the healthcare system. Also, we have conducted study to uh, learn about health information services need. Last summer, 
I complete study about COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy among Nebraskan with a specific focus on the Lincoln Yazidia and Lincoln communities. My ability to speak three languages helped me achieve such a timely study and provide recommendation to the Lincoln DHHS. My volunteer week as a contact tracer during early COVID-19 pandemic and with the new American task force here in Lincoln to help professional refugees and immigrants get back to their professional worlds. All this experience made me realize how important to work for the Lincoln community. Many people ask why do you choose to come to the Lincoln? The simple answers is they are ethnic minority group who faced many genocide throughout their histories. All Yazidia culture is about the peace and respecting the others, regardless of their religious background. We feel that the Lincoln communities share the same characteristics of peace, respecting the other, and living together. In fact, elderly Yazidia, like my mom, who live with us here in Lincoln, wear white clothes to symbolize the peace and community. Dear friends, as an American and Lincoln community, we are stronger together. The goal of each one of us should be how to make our city safe, united, and healthy by building on our diverse strong and strengths and values. I'm so proud to be part of this Lincoln community, and I'm excited about our future together. Thank you so much for welcoming me and my family. Good morning and welcome to the 38th annual Mayor's Interfaith Prayer Breakfast. I'm Lirian Gaylor-Baird and I'm delighted to feel your presence as we gather virtually for this cherished traditional celebration of the many faiths that nurture and enliven our spirits here in Lincoln, Nebraska. This event would not be possible without the dedication of so many and my deepest gratitude goes to the all-volunteer Mayor's Interfaith Prayer Breakfast Committee for their tireless efforts to organize this event in what can only be characterized as a labor of love. Thank you as well to our spiritual and faith leaders who offered their stirring messages and blessings to us. To conversation facilitator Joel Stoltenau of Lutheran Family Services. And of course, to our illustrious featured speaker, Sister Marilyn Lacey. A Kenyan proverb says, let the guest come so the host may be healed. Our community has taken these words to heart for decades. In the 1980s, Lincoln became a federally designated refugee resettlement site, welcoming over 5,500 refugees, mostly from Vietnam. Over time, waves of refugees from the Middle East, Eastern Europe, Africa, Iraq, Burma, and Afghanistan formed a current that today helps make Lincoln a strong and vibrant community, a community of 30,000 immigrants and refugees from 150 different countries, a community that was recently cited as the 12th largest site for refugee resettlement per capita in the country, a community where local entrepreneur Matthew Wegener last month boarded a plane to Hungary to help resettle a woman whom he had only met on Zoom as she fled war-torn Ukraine. A woman whose daughter lives with Matthew's family, a woman whom Matthew therefore considers part of his family too. You do whatever you need to take care of them, Matthew said. Well, caring for our new Americans and calming the waters of their arrival locally is the hallmark of Lincoln's faith communities. Two of our local agencies, Catholic Social Services and Lutheran Family Services, have helped resettle over 800 Afghan refugees displaced after the Taliban's takeover, and they're poised to support Ukrainian refugees who may come to Lincoln. Our faith communities regularly see the divine in the stranger, organizing donation drives to provide household appliances, clothing, lodging, and turkeys at Thanksgiving, and perhaps more significantly, breaking bread with new Americans and embracing them as friends. Our experience shows that welcoming the stranger is about even more than hospitality and cultural vibrancy. By opening the door to new Americans, we ensure local and regional growth. Between 2014 and 2019, Lancaster County's population increased by 6.5%, while the immigrant population grew by 16.2% meaning that over 18% of total population growth was attributable to immigrants. 
These new Americans are more likely to be of working age than their U.S.-born counterparts and are well positioned to participate actively in the workforce, to support or start businesses, and to contribute to our local economy. Recognizing the great value that new Americans bring to our community, the City of Lincoln and Lancaster County spent a year developing, and last week launched, a new welcoming and belonging strategic plan a plan to guide the continued successful integration of immigrants and refugees into our community and workforce. We understand that the work to ensure that newcomers enjoy a warm welcome and an ongoing experience of belonging is work in which all of us have a role to play and that is best accomplished with thoughtful intention. Thoughtful intention and truly devotion to welcoming the stranger is embodied by our honored guest, Sister Marilyn Lacey. For 25 years, Sister Lacey has worked with refugees in the U.S., Africa, and Southeast Asia. In 2008, she started Mercy Beyond Borders, an organization that forges ways for women and girls in extreme poverty to learn, connect, and lead. Today, the organization works in Haiti, South Sudan, Kenya, Malawi, and Uganda, empowered by the conviction that when women learn, women matter. We are blessed with her presence and wisdom this morning. When asked how she remains buoyant, working with strangers who have experienced so much trauma and pain, Sister Lacey simply remarked, possibly the best way to help is not to rescue those I love from their personal difficulties, but to just be with them and to walk with them in their journey. I hope that today's event inspires you to follow Sister Lacey's example, to walk with the stranger, to welcome the stranger and to walk with them in their journey. And with that, I'll hand this virtual gathering over to Prita Bunsel to welcome our guests, whose messages offer healing to all of us who host them this morning in this sacred space we are creating together. Thank you so much, Mayor, for your tremendous leadership in our city. It's such a joy for me to introduce to the Lincoln community, Marilyn Lacey, a sister of mercy whose faith journey took her from the confines of really a fairly rigid Catholic upbringing to discovering that God was appearing before her through the faces of so-called strangers of all colors, faiths, and backgrounds. She has been working tirelessly with displaced people for four decades, both in refugee camps overseas and in resettlement programs here in the US. For her life's work, Sister Marilyn was personally honored by the Dalai Lama in 2001 as an unsung hero of compassion. She holds lifetime teaching and administration credentials, a master's degree in social welfare from UC Berkeley, and four honorary doctorates. But she insists that her best teachers have been the world's poor. She has traveled well off the beaten path, ventured into war zones, and more than once stared down rebels carrying machine guns. Sister Marilyn is the founder and executive director of Mercy Beyond Borders, a nonprofit working with women and girls in several countries to alleviate extreme poverty. She has received illustrious global awards that are too many to list. Her spiritual memoir, This Flowing Toward Me, a story of God arriving in strangers is inspiring and full of uplifting and remarkable stories. And we're thrilled that Joel Stoltenow will draw out some of those stories in conversation with her this morning. Joel is an assistant vice president at Lutheran Family Services of Nebraska, which it has been one of the lead agencies resettling refugees in Lincoln and in our state. He previously was a teacher at Lincoln Lutheran High School and shares a love for sports with Mar Sister Marilyn. Apparently, Sister Marilyn was quite a serious baseball player in her youth, and Joel has been a celebrated basketball coach at both Lincoln Lutheran and at Nebraska Wesleyan. So Joel, over to you and to Sister Marilyn. Thank you both so much for your remarkable lives of service. Wow. <laughs> that was quite the intro and quite the momentum and um really sort of spiritual presence among everyone here. So good morning, everyone. As stated, my name is Joel, and I am uh, honored and blessed to work with Lutheran Family Services and uh, here in Lincoln and, and across the state. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, I just want to extend a special thank you to everyone who's already spoken. I want to do a specific uh, call out to those of you I can't see or touch through the Zoom medium, but uh, I have to admit already, of all the Zoom calls I've been on, this is already one of the most intimate and I suspect fulfilling. 
Uh, it's early on a Friday morning here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and it's even earlier on the West Coast. So, Sister Marilyn, thank you for being with us here. I hope to bring some of this to light. But welcome, everybody, to this year's prayer breakfast. And in just a comment to kind of tee us up here, I do believe, and I am reminded as I hear these words, that now more than ever, spiritual people need to have that foundation, not only for their strength and their source of um, purpose and calmness and presence in this world, but for the neighbor. And uh, I'm, I'm so honored to spend a little time here with Sister Mellon to have her um, take us deeper into that and, and explore that. So again, special welcome to everyone. Sister Marilyn, I'm going to tee it up this way. We've got two parts uh, that we want to focus on today. And for our audience, I think it'd be useful to preview that. Uh, the first part, we're going to talk about the awakening and the becoming attentive and living in the present. And the second part, we're going to talk about hospitality and welcoming. But before we get there, there's been a lot of pre-recorded messages here. Uh, we're two time zones apart. We're looking at screens. Let's just do a little bit of a personal interaction. Here we sit in the uh, middle of America. We're in the cornfields. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot you three rapid fire questions to bring out the personal side of you. Sister Marilyn, do you or do you not know what a corn husker is? It's some sort of machine, but in my mind, it's a football team that has won a lot of national championships. And the one fun fact that I know about the Cornhuskers uh, team is that they used to be called the Bug Eaters. So there's obviously a story behind that, but I love it already. We've already endeared yourself to the audience, so well <laughs> done there. Well done. Uh, what's your opinion of Zoom? Thumbs up or thumbs down on Zoom, Zoom technology? What do you think of Zoom calls? Uh, they are imperfect like the rest of us, but they are enabling connection in a time when connection is really hard to maintain. So I'm very grateful for the inventors of Zoom. And so are we, because you're a blessing to all of us. And for those of you who don't know yet, I spent an hour with her already. We're in for a huge treat. Uh, last one, a little bit more on the, the you know reflective side. When it comes to regrets, do you regret more the things you've done or the things you have not done? Oh, that's an easy question. The things I have not done. I have no regrets about the way I'm living my life. I'm having a fantastic life and it's full of cultures and perspectives and understandings of, of what matters and different value systems. And I've just been so enriched by my life. So I have no regrets there, but I do have regrets about what I've not done. The times I've not been attentive to people or responsive um, or compassionate enough. Uh, I have a favorite quote from a diplomat at the United Nations named Jan Eliasson. We haven't met, but I feel like I know him because he once wrote, without passion, nothing happens. But without compassion, the wrong things happen. And we're seeing that in our world today. So I take that insight very much to heart. And I, I think I have a lot of passion, but I don't always have enough compassion. And being a sister of mercy, you would think I would have learned that 50, over 50 years in the convent, but uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Da Great. Daily we learn, correct? Daily we yeah. learn. Yeah. Well, let's get to it. Thank you for a little bit of levity there to kind of bring out the personal side of you. Uh, two parts, like I said, let's, let's split this time up. Uh, the first part, let's focus on what you were calling awakening, uh, being attentive and living in the moment. Tell us a little more uh, what you mean by that, or why do you choose those words? Well, I know I was invited to speak about welcoming the stranger, and that's what I've spent my entire adult life doing. Uh, but over the years, what I have learned is you can't jump into that work without uh, inner awareness, right? And that's really the hard part. It's kind of energizing, exciting to go and fix up an apartment for a newly arriving refugee or take them to the supermarket for the first time or whatever. But to do that in a compassionate, uh, uplifting way, I really believe we need to be in touch with the present experience. That's where we find God. Huh? So I'll tell you a true story about a friend of mine that speaks to attentiveness. Her name is Sister Clarice, and she was a paratrooper before she entered the comet. So I'll give you an idea of what kind of a person she is. She's well, a, one of those uh, nuns. Okay, yeah, I, that kind yes, of sister. She's yeah, a, a midwife, a nurse and midwife, and has worked in very many underdeveloped places in the world. And she was in, I believe it was Tanzania, 
um, working as a midwife in a very remote clinic. And you know, near the equator, you get 12 hours of sunshine and then 12 hours of darkness. There is no much, there's not much time for twilight. Okay, so she was hurrying at the end of the day because uh, the light was fading. She had to go down to the river every, every evening, gather up all the cloths that she had used uh, in helping to give birth. Of course, they were bloody and soiled. She would go down to the river and rinse them off. And there had been a big storm that day. So the river was full of branches and things that hadn't been there before. And she was kind of making her way down the slippery side of the river and she saw a large uh, tree trunk. She thought, well, that's great. I'll walk out on that. It'd be easier to bend over and wash these cloths. So she was doing that, scrubbing the blood out of the cloths. And about 10 minutes later, the log she was standing on moved. It was a crocodile. <laughs> so uh, I love this story because of course she leaped quite agilely off that crocodile uh, to safety, but it reminds me so much that we are, we are often unaware of what we're standing on, huh? of what we're experiencing in the moment. We think we know and we go about our business, but sometimes it takes something to startle us to realize we need to pay attention. So I'd like to take maybe 10 minutes or so and talk about paying attention and, and this is really a spiritual discipline. And as Catholics, uh, Christians, we are in the period of Lent, which is, is a, a time of discipline um, for recognizing how God comes to us in our lives. So I'll start with two quotes. One is from St. Columba, uh, what, 15 centuries ago, uh, an itinerant preacher in what is now Scotland, I believe. I, I've never been there, I don't know that much about him, but he once shared with his brothers that this was his prayer. Quote, may I arrive at every place I enter, unquote. Let me say that one more time. May I arrive at every place I enter. Now, if you're anything like me, you're very busy, right? And you're rushing from one thing to the next. And maybe even right now you've tuned into this prayer breakfast, but you're worried about getting the kids to school on time. You're worried about that meeting you have at nine o'clock. You, you know, are you able to somehow sink into what is your present experience? God is not found in the past or the future. God is, God is met here and now. The other story is, from Fulani people who are uh, semi-nomadic in the Western part of Africa. And this is from a book uh, from a woman journalist who lived with the Fulani and tra traveled with them for a year, living in their tents and tending with their cattle and all of that. And she said they were a very independent group, obviously self-sustaining. But every once in a while they go near a town and they'd go into a marketplace to get the kinds of things they couldn't get elsewhere. And naturally, the shopkeepers would say, oh, you're, you're new here, where are you from? And they always answer this way. They say, we are here now. Wow, I wish I could pray like that. I mean, I wish I could say I am here right now. My mind isn't somewhere else that I am wholly present, W-H, holy, but also H-O, holy. Um, this, this ability is a discipline that we can train ourselves in, but it's also a grace. It's an invitation from God because when we sink into the present moment, we really have the chance to experience how God is gazing at us. And that is always lovingly. And if we can do that daily, hour by hour, bring ourselves back to that inner spark, we begin to experience ourselves as beloved. And something melts in us huh, when that happens. As it changed the life of Jesus at his baptism, experiencing 
his own Abba saying, you are my beloved son, my beloved one. When that happens, you have this, I, all I can say is it's like melting that leads to joy and leads to a desire to, for everyone to experience that joy, right? It, because if God is looking on me as beloved, then certainly God is looking at everyone and everything as beloved. So then why wouldn't I welcome others into my life? I want to get to know them. I want to understand the, the facet of God that is uh, revealed in this person and that person and another person. Uh, so and, and may I jump in and just kind of ask a question that's on sure. my mind. Even as much as you talk about prayer, don't we see in many faith traditions the practice, the spiritual practice of giving a blessing or offering a blessing? And, and I find great comfort in that the blessing isn't to achieve or to be more, but is is to see God and have God see you. And I appreciate how you articulated that, yeah. that a blessing or true prayer is being seen by God. You know that? I have that quote written down. That's one of my favorite lines. It's true. It's allowing ourselves being undefended in the present moment and allowing ourselves to be seen and be loved by God. I insisted that we spend some time talking about this this morning because that's the root of the compassion and the openness of heart that can truly welcome the stranger. It isn't so much about meeting them at the airport and making sure they have a social security card and all that. Yes, all those things are necessary and they follow. But all my life, that I, 21 years that I worked in refugee resettlement, I had refugees. I can remember a young Sudanese man, 18 years old, coming into my office one day. He'd been in the US in California about two months. Came in and he said, sister, how does one make friends in America? The streets are empty of people. Where, where can I, where can I engage? You know, huh. and it's true. They come from cultures. Many refugees come from cultures that are communal, and we are so individual, individualistic, so busy, so occupied with matters of consequence. You know, uh, that it's very that is that is the pain point for the refugees. Is how can I fit in? How can I make friends? And and to do that without being patronizing, we need to come from this position of this newcomer is beloved. What a privilege for me to be in his or her presence and learn from his, from him or her. Um, so let me tell you a story about being attentive. This actually happened to me uh, the day after I had time with the Dalai Lama. Now, the Dalai Lama, of course, is the world's most famous refugee. I've devoted my life to working with migrants and refugees. So it was a very special day for me. But uh, I don't want to talk about that day. I want to talk about what happened to me the next morning. Uh, I got up, did my meditation, came to have breakfast, and I opened up the San Jose Mercury News. So I'd be up on the news before I went to work. And there, in the newspaper, in color, no less, is a photo of the Dalai Lama hugging me and putting the blessing cloth, the kata, around my shoulders. So I saw it and I thought, wow, my mother's going to love this. You know how mothers are. They, anytime something wonderful happens to their kids, they're going to celebrate. So I was thinking, this is cool. This is pretty cool. Um, and she had been there with me that day in, in the audience. So I knew she would treasure that picture. So I finished my breakfast, I get in the car, and I have to stop for gas on the way to my refugee resettlement work. So I do. And I'm, the whole time I'm thinking about how fun it was to be with the Dalai Lama, what I learned from him and all of that. And then I finish, I drive, start to drive away. And you, I heard the sound you never, ever want to hear when you are driving out of a gas station, which is this metallic screeching sound that indicates you have forgotten to take the hose out of your car, all right? Because I was totally not paying attention. I was not in the present moment. I was dreaming about the day before, right? With the Dalai Lama. So I'm horrified. I had never done this before. I, I slam on the brakes. Uh, I, of course, the, the hose thing stops automatically, but not 
before it had spilled out several puddles of oily petrol, you know. So I've created a mess and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to pull out my insurance card or pay the guy or whatever. So as I'm scrambling to reach for my purse and get out of the car and see this disaster I've caused, I can see a small man, maybe five foot two, running out of the booth. And he, he's running toward me and he does not look happy. You know, he's going, what in the world? <gasps> it's you. <laughs> I'm like, huh? You know? And he comes right up to me and he's bowing all, you know, halfway to the ground. And I'm stumbling over my words. I say, sir, I, I'm so sorry. He's the gas station attendant. Um, I have, I've made a mess now. What, what can I do? Can I exchange information or pay you for the, your trouble? Whatever he goes, no, I feel it is such an honor that you come to my place of work. And I'm, I'm like, not getting it at all. And then he's, um, it turns out this guy was Tibetan and he was reading the Mercury News and he saw my photo and he recognized me because I was wearing the same jacket that I was in the photo. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh yeah, right, right. But you know, how can I make this, fix this problem we have? And he said, no, 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 no. It is not a problem. I ask only one thing, may I touch you? Then I got it. He, he saw in the photo that the Dalai Lama had touched me. And because of his belief that the Dalai Lama is the incarnation of the divine, and he had no hope of ever meeting the Dalai Lama himself, he thought, of course, if I can touch Sister Marilyn, I will have met the divine. And I'm like, wow, I learned more from this person than I did from the Dalai Lama. Because, and, and it just struck me with such force. Here I am, an old lady wrecking his day. Right. And he looked past that and he saw in me someone whom the divine had touched or someone who had touched the divine. We, we embraced the Dalai Lama and I. And he, his only desire was to reach the divine through the person standing in front of him. What a lesson for my life. You know, I do spend time in churches. I do spend time in meditation. And I think I was raised to bring, to believe that those were the places I would most meet God. It hasn't turned out that way. I most meet God in and through other people. And so what a privilege the city of Lincoln has that you've become a center of welcoming. I mean, I just, I think that's fabulous. But I urge you to sink into this desire to become more attentive before you rush around doing all the stuff that resettlement requires. Uh, because otherwise you'll just be resettling people. You won't really be welcoming them, right? And seeing them as blessings in your life. Um, so the story of, you know, where are you from? The answer is, well, I'm here now. And that's just not, not true just of refugees. It's true of you and me. I'm here now today. So what are the blessings that are coming toward me? That being present to that grace, to that divine uh, flowing. And let me just get my next note here. I will close my story of the Dalai Lama and the gas station attendant by saying, I have often thought that I should change my business card, instead of saying executive director of Mercy Beyond Borders, I should say attendant, like that gas station attendant. I wish I could attend to whoever is with me in each moment. And I know I can't see your faces. That's the one downside of Zoom. Uh, I don't know if you're even listening, but if we can all kind of pull together to the present moment, what a different world we'd have because we would feel beloved. We wouldn't be out harming other people. We'd be 
opening our hearts and receiving the belovedness of others uh, and the belovedness of, that we experience from God through others. Sister Marilyn, I'm gonna rejoin the, the presentation, if you will. I can promise you, you have the attention of us here. Thank you for that. <laughs> Where do you wanna go next? Some of the notes in this section talk a little bit about um, the way we try and limit God. And if I may reflect a little bit, you talked about the difference between being attentive. And by the way, I'm never gonna get gas the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that stark visual image. Well, you know, what, a, what an amazing thing that this guy happened to be a uh, Tibetan and happened to be looking at the same photo, you know, and, and saw me. So I was flustered and everything. I wasn't paying attention uh, at all. And he was. And and he, I learned even so in his title, that. he's the attendant, right? He's yeah. attendant to you. Exactly. I, I just, I could... Great story. Um, we have the part two coming up, but I think there's a little time if you wanted to touch on anything else. Where I was going with that is your reference to you know spending time in worship formally well, or being attentive, limiting God. We talked about that a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. this, you know, churches are important, of course. They are they are a locus, a place where we can come together and celebrate and be encouraged and as that word means, given courage to do things that we maybe wouldn't feel up to taking the risk of doing alone like welcoming a refugee family. So this is a wonderful reason for churches. But the downside of churches is that over time, each of our faith traditions kind of solidifies into its way of doing things and its way of seeing God and its way of um, excluding others who don't have that same view that we have, uh, all of which are tremendous limitations on the divine. And, and we try to, we try to, scrunch God into our understanding of God, which of course is pitifully insufficient and wrong. Um, so I love the quotation from the Hebrew tradition that says, Abraham's tent was open on all four sides, right? It's, it's an, a lovely image. You can picture it in your mind uh, in the desert but this large tent and it doesn't have walls. Huh? It has, it's open. So it's, it's open to visitors as we know from the stories in Genesis. It's, it's open to other experiences and it's open to a, a growing understanding of who, who God is, whether we call God by what name, but whatever name or whatever faith tradition, we cannot confine God to our tradition. And that's one of the extraordinary blessings in my life is that I have worked with so many different faith traditions, not inside their churches or mosques or synagogues, but out in, out in refugee camps, um, uh, you know, at the airport, welcoming them to a new country, et cetera, et cetera. So a great blessing for me has been that God cannot be confined. And when we try to confine God, as sadly in our Catholic tradition, we say we can, God is in our tabernacle. Well, in, a, in our churches, tabernacle is the Latin word for tent. So I, instead of a little gold box, I'm, I'm clinging to Abraham's tent that's open on all four sides. And, and that's, of course, why interfaith dialogue and what you're doing in Lincoln and what you're doing here today is so crucial. If we had more of that, there would be less war. And religious wars are the worst of all, as we know. So I think with that understanding of the importance of attentiveness that we recognize over time, we don't need to be defended against God. We don't need to prove anything. We don't have to be perfect. I spent many years trying to be perfect nun. I have long abandoned that in favor of compassion. That is what matters. Uh, and then that leads us naturally toward welcoming. And in the Sufi tradition, there are so many magnificent uh, poems and prayers that I use them often in my own prayer. And in fact, took a line from a Sufi poem as the title of my spiritual memoir. Uh, this flowing toward me is a line from a poem. And I wanna just uh, recite one stanza of this, this prayer uh, by Rumi. It starts off, for 60 years, I have been forgetful, huh? inattentive, right? I've been forgetful every minute, yet not for a second has this flowing toward me 
stopped or slowed. Let me read it one more time. For 60 years, or you can insert however old you are, for 60 years, I have been forgetful every minute, yet not for a second has this flowing toward me stopped or slowed. This flowing toward me, this goodness of God, this belovedness, beloved gaze from God that creates a belovedness in each of us. So that experience of being welcomed by God, being loved by God, is what can transform us into becoming welcoming people. And I wasn't always that way. I, I grew up in a very insular family, uh, five kids, loving parents, playing baseball every day, going to school. You know, that was my life. I had no awareness of diversity or suffering or global wars or anything until uh, really until I was in high school. So the world that I knew it was not the whole world. The God that I knew was not the whole God. And I think we can, we can say that each of us, if we examine our own experience. Um, so hospitality, welcoming. I think I'm preaching to the choir, right, Joel? Yeah. You guys are good at this the, stuff. But keep preaching, sister. Keep preaching. <laughs> well, um, I I just like to say I, I have only one slice of the truth, huh? And and we all need to combine our slices so we come to something that that really is meaningful. Um, and and I would just start out by saying that we've in many of our churches we have domesticated God. You know, we've confined God to to a safe set of rituals. And we've stopped as churches taking risks and speaking truth to power. Um, and those are things that we need to grow out of. Um, hospitality in the US culture in many, many ways is inviting your friends over for dinner. That is not the biblical idea of hospitality. You know, like, uh, it, hospitality is a radical risk-taking stance toward the world that I'm here now and there's all this suffering around me and all of these needs and am I going to drop my defenses and share my resources not just my extras but my resources uh, to invite people to the table perfect strangers no, most of us are scared to death of strangers. We're told to lock our doors against strangers. It's a dangerous world. Oh, that is true. And yet as church, together, we can do those things, um, which I personally believe is the only reason for church. I think our faith tradition, whatever it is, ought to be a catapult, not a cocoon. And in many of, uh, for many of us, it, it's, it's a cocoon. Church is a safe place to go where everybody looks like us and we, we know the prayers by heart. Uh, but I certainly don't see that in the lives of the founders of most faith traditions, certainly not in the life of Jesus. Um, there should be no safety in religion except the safety of knowing that we are beloved by God. And that gives us, that, that flings us, you know? Um, the German poet Rilke, he says of God, he says, we are lovingly held by you and then flung forth. And that is true. That is so true. Uh, another theologian, uh, Dorothy Zilla from Germany also says, mysticism or that experience of being beloved, huh? it's open to all of us, but mysticism is bliss, but it also makes us homeless because it catapults us out of our safety zone. And if you get involved with migrants and refugees as you, your churches are in, uh, in Lincoln, you'll find that out. It's not always comfortable. It's certainly not always easy. And migrants and refugees are not all saints as much as we would love to you know, think so. And, and we aren't either, right? Um, Sister so Marilyn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in um, just because 
first of all, I am present here and you, you've drawn us in. Uh, I'm also aware of, of some things. So you can feel free to put a bow on that on that part. But I do want to open up the discussion and your word catapulting is going to stick with me. Uh, just like a, a gas station attendant, I won't be able to see the same. I'm probably not going to look at a cocoon the same now anymore. So <laughs> once again, thank you for weaving these images into our time today. But I do want to give you some time to discuss how your work has catapulted you to influence the whole world with Mercy Beyond Borders. And um, so again, just kind of teeing you up if you want to finish up anything there, but do want to leave you, you know, five, six minutes to talk about uh, Mercy Beyond Borders and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, I realize I'm talking too much, but hey, I have a microphone now, so <laughs> bear with me. You know, Annie Dillard in her book, oh, maybe 40 years ago said, um, the book was called Teaching a Stone to Talk. She said, and I quote, it is madness to wear ladies' hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. The ushers should strap us to our pews. They should issue life preservers. For God may draw us to where we can never return. I think I think she's spot on, right? Church ought to be a dangerous adventure. Uh, faith ought to be a catapult. And that's what it has become for me as I have recognized my own belovedness. Um, if I may start this part about Mercy Beyond Borders or sum it up by saying another poem from Rumi, the Sufi master. It's very short, so listen up. Be the one who, when you walk into a room, luck, or we would say blessing, shifts to the one who needs it most. Even if you've not been fed, be bread. Even if you've not been fed, be bread. To me, this idea of uh, recognizing our belovedness, living in the present, then reaching out in compassion to uh, enfold, welcome, give hospitality to the strangers, because God is the ultimate stranger, right? Um, that led me away from refugee resettlement, which I did in California, as you are doing in Lincoln, it led me to think about those who don't get resettled, that are stuck back in the refugee camps, which 99.5% of refugees never come to a place of permanent resettlement. 99.5%. So I spent 20 years working with the one half of 1%. Now I'm working with those who never get that chance. So I founded a nonprofit called Mercy Beyond Borders. And I think that line from Rumi sums it up. Um, it's about crossing borders. It's about, it's about sharing the blessings that, that you've been graced with. So not holding on to them. So when I walk into a room, wherever I am, whoever I'm with, I want my blessings to leave me and go to that person. So we don't cling to what is ours. We share it all. We, we try to be bread for those who've not been fed, right? Or even when we're feeling like we've not been fed. So that kind of solidarity led me to South Sudan, the worst place I had ever seen in my life and still one of the most um, uh, besieged places on the planet. It doesn't make the news like Ukraine and other places, but uh, it is, I can't describe it. I describe one chapter of my book, I describe it and how I went there, at the height of the civil war in 1992 and what I saw changed me forever and made me want to stand with the poorest of the poor cross borders. So that's why I call it mercy beyond borders is to take our compassion, whatever capacity we have for compassion and don't let it stop with your own family or your own church or congregation or synagogue, make it expand moment by moment uh, to embrace the suffering of the world. So we are working in five countries, as uh, Preeta mentioned at the outset, places of extreme poverty as defined by the UN. So we're talking subsistence level, very dire situations. And we work only with females because in those places and in as in many parts of the world, it's females that get the short end of the stick. So what are we doing in these places? We ask the women, what do you need? You know, you're coming out of war, you're coming out of refugee camps, what do you need? Always, they said, 
educate my children, especially my daughters, because they've never been to school. In some cultures, as we know, they are excluded from schooling. So that's what we are doing primarily. We're educating girls in the villages of South Sudan, in the refugee camps of Uganda and Kenya, in the mountains of Haiti. And now we've just begun also in rural Malawi, which is surprisingly the fifth poorest country in the world. So we're taking girls out of refugee camps, putting them into boarding schools. We now have uh, 72 women, young women who have finished university, for example, in South Sudan. That, that may sound like a trivial number to you, but before we started Mercy Beyond Borders, in which was 2008, the statistics from 2007 show that only 11 girls in the entire country graduated from high school that year. There just were no girls in school. So the fact that over the past 14 years, we have gotten hundreds and hundreds of girls through high school and 72 now graduated as alumni. And as we speak this week, they are at an advocacy training in Juba, the capital of South Sudan, to learn how to use their education to advocate now for human rights for the next generation of girls coming up behind them. Um, if you wanna learn more, you can go to our website, mercybeyondborders.org. Um, love to have you pray for our work. Uh, it's very dangerous actually um, in the places where we work, dangerous for staff and dangerous for the women and girls we work with, but we do see progress. We see tremendous motivation. Um, there's lots of ways you could help our mission we are a, a non-sectarian nonprofit because I didn't want to go in working on behalf of one's particular faith tradition. We are open to all and working with all. Um, and there are many ways you can help. Of course, people think about donating. Well, I wouldn't say no to that, but prayer is important. Telling other people about us is really important. Uh, on our website, the bottom of the homepage, you could sign up for our, the newsletter, which is very short, that I write once a month so that you can tell stories like the stories I've been telling you today. Um, and what else? You could invite me to speak. I love to tell stories and I haven't really gotten into the stories of the women and girls of Mercy Beyond Borders, but they're just as riveting as the Dalai Lama story and, and perhaps more so, they, they inspire me every day. So I love to, uh, I would love to get in front of your congregation or your book club or your synagogue or whatever, and have 45 minutes or an hour to just share experiences and fire them up to use the compassion and the belovedness to make this world a better place. Um, and when people say to me, well, there's enough misery in America, I don't need to worry about South Sudan or Haiti or whatever. I say, okay, I agree. There's plenty of misery everywhere, but to make this world a better place, each of us has to do something locally as you're doing in Lincoln, and something globally for the brothers and sisters whom we've not yet met. Well, Sister Marilyn, oh, go ahead and let you finish that thought. I'm there. done. I'm done. No, you've actually just begun because you've caused us to think, um, as, as you quoted in, in the presentation, that, and there's so much more to discuss. There's a link to the website uh, at both the beginning and end of this presentation. I'm holding your book here. It's been a blessing to me. Uh, I think people can find out more that way. Um, but I want to share a final thought. And then if you'd be open to it, just uh, send us off the blessing for all of us who are going to go about our ways, encounter people uh, with, with the mindset that we've now uh, been revisiting today. But the author Mason wrote in the book, Four Feathers, God put you in my way. And I believe that's what's personally happened for me. And I pray for everyone who's listened. Thank you. Praise God for having you be put in my way today. Um, I've I've been blessed and it's not just a typical Friday now. We, we do go about our business. We get in the grind, we look at our calendars, but uh, what a blessing to slow down and, and have these thoughts. So with that, I wanna thank you and I wanna give you the floor to close us off. Thank you. Thank you again, Joel, and everyone who has uh, had a part in inviting me to be with you today. I think for the blessing, I would invite us to imagine that we are present to the God who wants us to allow ourselves to be known and loved. So God, your longing 
is that we recognize the way you see us and that belovedness will melt our hearts and open our hands to welcome and see our brothers and sisters as beloved also. We pray for this great gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Hello, my name is Ed Mejia. I am a designer, artist, and creative director and it's a real honor to have been asked to share a bit about my story and the story of the Lincoln flag that I designed recently. The flag was selected, the new flag designed for our city of Lincoln, and much of the symbolism I wanted to imply in the design was based on my very own experience as an immigrant, uh, a refugee to the United States, and eventually a member of our city. From what I understand about the Lincoln's Mayor Interfaith Breakfast, this event is a really great opportunity for those that represent so many of our diverse faith and humanist institutions to gather in one place and share a moment that celebrates what we all have in common, which is compassion and love for one another. This is not specific to any one specific dogma or religion. Compassion and love are the abilities to see beyond our very own individual selves by stretching our arms out to help those in need much like Sister Marilyn Lacey has done throughout her mission and career. The theme, Welcoming the Stranger, plays really well with what I was thinking when I was designing the Lincoln flag, and it means a lot to me as I wasn't born here or didn't grow up here in Lincoln, but Lincoln as a community has welcomed me with open arms and has been home for over 20 years. I was born in a small Central American country named El Salvador. This is a nation whose name literally translates to the savior, El being the, Salvador being savior. And in my Christian upbringing, this name wasn't just an abstraction. Um, my parents firmly believed in the message of the Bible and that Jesus, the Christian savior, was here to show us in person, in the flesh, what it was like to love one another profoundly, selflessly, and devoid of prejudice. As a symbol or icon, the flag that I worked on has many allusions to hope and community. Everyone that submitted a design for the flag contest received a creative brief, which told us some of the themes that needed, needed to be implied in the flag. In the very first bullet of the brief, it says, it asked that we imply a theme that reflects Lincoln as a welcoming city, home to many refugees and immigrants. And that meant a lot to me as someone who had experienced that personally. Um, and so I wanted the flag to feel centered and needed to feel like the lines and any bit of the flag were alluding to these ideals, the concentric lines, and they were set in perspective. And these lines had to imply that the, at the center of Lincoln, no matter where we come from, we are all welcome here. We are all welcome strangers. Thank you very much and blessings to you all. Good morning, my name is Farida Abraham and I am with the Muslim community of Lincoln. On this day that we have gathered to join hands in prayer for our fellow human beings, the world is in chaos. Today I like to dedicate this prayer of justice and peace to those who cannot speak for themselves. In the last six months, two nations were thrown into hellfire, Afghanistan and Ukraine. This is 80 million people total. Both of these situations were preventable but it happened. This is in addition to wars that has been continuing in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Myanmar, Libya, and so on. As people were watching a glimpse of these events happening from far away, we might see some refugees making it out. But what happens to people who are left behind? My country of birth, Afghanistan, fell into the hands of the terrorist Taliban on August 15th. The corrupt leaders backed by foreign nations fled the country with large sums of money. Now ethnic cleansing is happening. People are being driven out of their homes. 
most of these people don't have anything. They're poor peasants, landowners. And other people, mainly in the north and central, are being driven out. And people from across the border are brought in to replace them. There's such poverty that people started uh, selling their part, body parts and now they're selling their children because there is no other way. Executions of government uh, employees and army members are just a daily news. The Taliban had them down and they killed them. And even not that, common people are killed on the road and checkpoints. Women are excluded from work and all their rights, they can't leave the, they can't leave the house. So they've been protesting and they've faced um, intimidation, shootings, and imprisonment. Private prisons are in high rise. People disappear without trace. House to house searches are going on. Most, most of these homes are, are women headed and you're not supposed to enter in them. That's not in our culture, but Taliban are. And in some cases they execute the whole family. People of Afghanistan and other countries like Afghanistan are left alone to fight with these beasts by themselves. Let us pray today for all, all that ill that is. Let us pray today for all the ill that's happening in the world to our fellow human being, regardless of their race, gender, religion, wealth, or geographic location. Let us pray to God to help us see beyond what's in front of our eyes. Give us compassion, humility, give us wisdom to appreciate what we have and see what we can do for our fellow human beings. Let us pray for peace and justice for all human beings as they do not deserve any less. If they were born in Afghanistan, Yemen, Libya, Syria, Iraq, Myanmar, or Ukraine. Amen. As our time is coming to a close, let me share just a few thoughts. In her book, This Flowing Toward Me, Sister Marilyn asks the question, where are my gates, my borders? Where do I draw the line, telling myself it isn't necessary to care about anyone outside the particular orbit of my current concerns? Another way to look at this is to think about the boxes into which we have placed ourselves when we speak about nations, races, and religions. Fear is our biggest challenge in these times. Fear of the other, fear of the stranger. Sister Marilyn speaks of a word in the Lao vocabulary, metta, meaning mercy or profound compassion. Metta rises from the core wisdom uncovered by mystics of all the world's great religions, namely that we are all connected. The young Afghan family newly arrived in Lincoln, the former Somalian or Iraqi or Bosnian or Laotian refugee who has settled in Lincoln, put down roots and thrived. The homeless man or woman living in an encampment under a bridge. The transgender youth longing for a sense of belonging, of being acknowledged as beloved. The person whose beliefs differ from our own. The clerk at the checkout counter wherever we shop. The mom or dad working two or more jobs yet barely making ends meet. The widow, the orphan, the stranger. In his book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, John Philip Newell states, compassion needs not be just a feeling, but also to be embodied, both in the relationships of our lives and communities, and in the structures of our societies and our nations. Without grounding compassion justly in the detail of relationship, we rob it of its greatest power to transform and to heal. Let us then open our eyes to the community, to the world around us. What do we see? To whom are we being called to show love and compassion? 
May we let loose our fears that separate us from one another. May we see beyond our own borders, our own boxes, with eyes of compassion. May we welcome the stranger among us. Thank you for being here with us for our virtual Lincoln Mayor's Interfaith Prayer Breakfast. Thank you to all of our presenters, and especially to Sister Marilyn and to Joel. Thank you to Carla Ingstrom. Thank you to our sponsors and to all those who have worked hard to put this event together. Go now and seek out the stranger in your midst. Show compassion to all you meet. Good morning. I'm Carla Ingstrom, president of the Nebraska chapter of Jewel Heart, a Tibetan Buddhist group. Our late teacher, Gallic Rinpoche, escaped Tibet the same time as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They endured cold, sleepless, hungry days and nights trekking over the Himalayas. They sought refuge in another land in India, and they were welcomed. In the early 90s, Lincoln welcomed Gallic Rinpoche and provided a safe haven for him to establish a Sangha. Both Rinpoche and the Dalai Lama were refugees and escaped the horrors of war, torture, and death. Tibet is still fighting to be free. I'm not a Lama or a teacher, but I'm happy to share our prayers with you. During the pandemic, Jewel Heart spiritual advisor, Demo Rinpoche, the nephew of Gallic Rinpoche, composed a prayer for the world. All living beings are my parents. All living beings are my siblings. When all living beings are suffering, I fervently generate indestructible love and compassion. By the blessings of immeasurable love, by the force of awareness of unmistaken truth, of all previous great holy beings, may all living beings be free from the dangers of illness. Grasping hands in a circle of friendship, seeing the wisdom of benefit to self and others by the perfections of generosity, morality, and patience, may all living beings be free from the dangers of illness. This disease, as well as all future wars, famine, and crises, shall not arise to be named from the smallest plant to every creature on this planet. May all be victorious over unwanted harm. In Tibet, the people chant the country's mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. It means the jewel in the lotus or jewel heart. It is recited to generate love and compassion. So for the benefit of all living beings, and especially for those in Lincoln, and for those at this breakfast, we offer Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. May we generate love and compassion. May all beings have happiness. May they be free from suffering. May they find the joy that has never known suffering. May they be free from attachment and hatred. We dedicate our virtues and by this merit, by this wonderful interfaith breakfast, may all quickly attain the state of enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you.